a couple of a couple of closing things about the levels and also underground atmosphere so again it's large islands the islands allow me to make small pockets of gameplay and have an easy boundary to it it's just ocean and you can't swim uh, but then we have these these caves underneath the caves underneath have been designed to try and eliminate loading screens i'm not sure if i'm going to succeed in that but the point was that while you're in caves you can't see too much and then then it and then I can easily unload the previous part and load the next part of the level. So therefore the caves are streaming levels. So there is a streaming system in Unreal. You can see here I have two levels. This is very simple setup. I'm going to have to extend this later on. But it's just to get going on it. Uh, so persistent level is the actual island outside. So I can't really unload the persistent level actually right now. Which is why my setup is wrong. But I'll adjust that later. But the cave is streamed in. If I hide the cave... You can see the entire cave will disappear. So the cave system eventually, when I'm done, will only be loaded when you get near the caves. And it's a very large cave right now. Probably have to gonna split that up in multiple caves and stream them per part, but it works. So when you go into caves, I need to be able to switch atmosphere. It has to be a different atmosphere inside and outside, right? So before for that, I have this check. If you're underneath minus 512, you're in caves. So the world is always above zero. For the C is basically zero. If it's above the C, it's above uh, zero. If you're under zero, it means you're underground or drowning. So by doing so, I can disable all the weather and all the disasters and everything else by checking the height of the player. And then I have to blend in the cave atmosphere. So I blend in post-processing. That's quite easy. That's just uh, standard support through the volumes. And then I uh, activate some particles. So when it starts, I can show you. Let me quickly turn off the light. F2 turns off the light, by the way, so it's unlit. So you can easily walk through. So now it's beginning to blend. Up, blend. So it also blends the distance fog. For example, the atmospherical fog. Everything blends into cave mode as you walk down. And now it's pitch black, almost. See, there's a torch lying here, so let me pick up the torch, makes it a bit easier. So the caves are completely pitch black, which makes it nice and optimized. Uh, I don't need light maps in the caves. Everything is black anyway. And the torch you're carrying gives light. The torch has two lights, actually. One orange one with a small radius and a blue light attached to it as well, with no shadows, but a bigger radius. And what I'm after is getting this nice color palette with a strong orange and still have some blue and some detail in the distance. That blue are particles that are lit by the fire. If I were to drop my torch here and walk away, it would eventually become pitch black. So the blue isn't actually distance fog, it's actually actual particle sprites moving around. You can see as I move away it gets pitch black and I disappear into the darkness. Uh, the particle sprites, might be hard to see here, are attached to the player in the same way that the rain is attached to the player. So when it starts to rain outside, I actually attach a local li little rain cloud to the player that follows the player. Same way here, the cave particles, they automatically follow the player. So again, it, it's very light on level design. Anyone building a cave underneath minus 512 will automatically get these particles present. So everything I try to do, I try to do with uh, keeping speed in mind. I can show you how I did as uh, one of the last few things. So here we have the player. If you look at the components, we can see here cave smoke. That's a particle. If I activate that, you can see what happens. It spawns a whole lot of particle clouds surrounding it and some small dust. This is not very FPS friendly. But then again, I have a single player game and you're playing in a cave. So you can't really see much anyway. So I figured I could lose the performance for doing this. But uh, doing this in a multiplayer game out outdoors or something is probably not the best idea. But this is basically attached to the player and this is what, this is what makes cave, caves look blue. In the same way, I have a local rain cloud as well. And when I activate that, it starts to rain. But the rain is just a local cloud surrounding the player. That's it. So as you're moving around, the cloud just follows you. If I would have added rain through the entire level, it would have been way too FPS heavy. And then lastly, to close off, I uh, would like to take a look at the uh, latest version of Unreal Engine and uh, show you how we're now progressing from what you've just seen 
to what we're going to do in the future. So we have quite a lot of blueprints. Um, you can do a lot with blueprints, as you've seen, but we do start to slowly begin to hit uh, the limits. Of course, blueprints are really powerful, but it can never replace C++ and not intended to do so either. It's a tool to empower artists and designers, not to replace programmers. So we are starting to hit some limits. So in, in order for us to continue and make sure we have enough flexibility and control in the future, we are now beginning to move functionality over to C++. We're still in the process of doing so, um, but we are moving forward on it. So I can show you a couple of the things we're doing. For one, the damage system wasn't ideal. So the damage system, we used to do that manually. Now it's starting to be automated. This is actually done. In fact, I can probably just delete this. The reduction of health is done ent entirely internally in C++ now. Uh, we have a lot of casting going on as well. Casting is needed to get values from one actor to another. Uh, so for example, the PDA, pocket computer thing you're holding, in order for that thing to understand what kind of health it has, you had, um, it has to call on the game state and the game state has to be casted to the right type of game state and then only then you get the right values. And we believe that this casting might be a little bit slow or in, in any case it clutters up our blueprint. So, we, so we're starting to simplify a lot of that. We're starting to uh, hard code some of the variables in C++ which allow us to easily get whatever we need. So if we need a health for example, we can easily get Solus player health. So we instantly have the value. And we instantly have that value without costing, no matter where we are. So if I take, for example, the level blueprint here, if you are in the level blueprint, I can get player health there as well. So without doing any costing, I instantly get all the variables I need. So we're adding a lot of variables to the game now, all hard-coded in C++ in order to make things a bit more optimized and a bit faster. We're also moving some of the functionality entirely over. So the thing mentioned earlier for example was the indoor check it's entirely removed it's entirely done in c++ now and it simply outputs a bool whether you're indoor or not so we are starting to simplify things and as we're moving forward also the footsteps are gone the footsteps are now entirely handled in c++ much more optimized as well um, and so on so we're improving things next is probably going to be the inventory system Current inventory system works fine, but it does get hard if you want to, for example, have a loading, a load and save system. Saving this is doable. It's possible to do actually in pure blueprint, but it could have been easier and faster. So we're just going to go for the easier route here. And also the current inventory system, it works fine, but eventually we want to have an inventory screen. We're working on that. So you're actually able to open an inventory screen and see how, uh, how everything looks like what kind of items you have, what the values are of those items, and so on. So as we're moving forward, we're slowly beginning to move part of it to C++. We're also starting to group things together. For example, we could have grouped all of this together in a single C++ node. That's how we're moving forward. In any case, I hope you learned some things for, from this video. Uh, it's a rough overview, really. It goes quite fast, I'm thinking. And... Uh, it's probably much too fast to learn anything from, but I hope it has been interesting to watch. And uh, I hope to explain more of this in detail in some uh, later on videos I will do later on. Thank you.